Hey guys, how's it going? My name is Theo. Thanks for hanging out with me today. I'm so excited to do this video. No long intro, no nothing. This video is simply going to be my top 10 favorite books of all time. These are the books that brought me the most joy when I read them. They're the ones that I think about the most, the ones that impacted me as a reader. They're the ones that I recommend first and foremost, above all else, the ones that I really wanted to share with you. I was a little bit apprehensive about making a top 10 list because Disclaimer number one, it's my top 10 list, not your top 10 list. We're both adults. We can enjoy, you know, differing opinions and, and still be friends. So honestly, if there's a book that's your favorite that didn't make my list, chances are I didn't read it. So I apologize in advance if you don't see some of your favorites on this list. I'm going to try to do my best and explain what makes these so special for me. Disclaimer number two is there's no repeats. It's basically going to be one per author or one per series. I have to pick the best book or my favorite out of a series. Like I said, no repeat authors, that kind of stuff. Another disclaimer is there's a lot of honorable mentions I could have picked. I really did the, the, the hard work and drilled this down to only 10 books. So I think that is all the disclaimers I wanted to get out of the way. Maybe one more. You're not going to see a whole lot of classics on this. You're not going to see a lot of prescribed university reading, Pride and Prejudice, a bunch you know, whatever. You're not going to see weird books like How to Make Friends and Influence People. These are fun fiction books. They're the ones that I enjoy the reading, the reading the most. They're fantasy, sci-fi, horror, speculative fiction, that kind of stuff. That's typically what I read. So that's what you're going to see here. Without further ado, let's go ahead and pick up book number one. This is where I'm going to lose some of you right off the bat. I hope you guys will bear with me and let me explain why this is so important to me. So the first book, book number 10 on my list is Prisoner of Azkaban, book number three in the Harry Potter series. This is a beautiful Minolima edition. You probably can't see it because it's really shiny, but it's illustrated and it has wonderful like pop-up stuff and interactive stuff. It's gorgeous, gorgeous quality. And I can't wait to read it with my like kids one day. Uh, but the reason why this is on the list, Harry Potter was without a doubt my generation's fantasy. It, it spurred an entire generation of readers and I remember the magic and the immersion of this story. And I do remember that this was the book where things built momentum, things turned a little bit, it got a little bit more dark, it got a little bit more adult. There were more characters, more important characters that were introduced to that carry weight with the plot and relationships and things started happening. And like I said, it became more adult. And with the third book in the series, it really became a rich, immersive series, you know, in fantasy. And I, it, like I said, it made an entire generation of fantasy readers, myself included. This is where I really found my love for fantasy fiction and the magic that could be in a story. <laughs> no, magic, obviously. But yeah, I just, I love this series. I've reread this a couple times now. I've read the, I've listened to the Jim Dale audiobooks. He's kind of my guy. Stephen Fry is very good too. Every couple years, I, I start to want to, reread these because of the magic and it takes me back to being a young person and cultivating my love for reading and i just remember sitting with this and reading it and being really shocked at how awesome books could be and so that's why this is on my list it's number 10 no honorable mentions we'll start here this is number 10. book number nine is one that Honestly, I didn't think was going to work for me, but I was pleasantly surprised. Now it's one of my favorite books of all time and one that I recommend all the time. And that is The Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller. This is a Greek myth retelling the story of Achilles told through the perspective of his lover and friend Patrocles set against the backdrop of the looming Trojan War. And it's done so beautifully well. And the characters are very rich and compelling. And she has this very interesting way of humanizing these legendary mythological figures and making it a very grounded emotional story. It talks about love and ambition and destiny and honor and, you know, devotion. And it was just so moving a lot more than I thought it would be for me. I typically don't get you know, wrenched like that and uh, and hit in the feels too much when I read. Occasionally I do, but definitely this one, I think I cried a little bit at the end. It was just a very, a very good story. Like I said, very lyrical prose, beautifully written. I can't wait to read more from her. And if you in any way like romance, uh, romanticy, if you like Greek stories, historical fiction, historical fantasy, if you like mythological figures and you know, the legends of people like Achilles and that kind of thing. But if you also like 
uh, a little bit of politicking, a little bit of war brewing, um, that type of setting. You'll really like this book. I would recommend this. I think it's won a bunch of awards. She handled this story with a lot of care and attention. It's clear that she's educated when it comes to Greeks and Greek history and, and mythology and all that. She did an excellent job and I would recommend this book to everybody. Book number eight makes up the conclusion to one of my favorite epic fantasy series of all time. This is book number four in the quartet that makes up The Faithful and the Fallen by John Gwynne. This book is Wrath. This is epic quest fantasy that is both classic and modern at the exact same time. I love John Gwynne's writing. He has very fast, punchy, you know, momentum building chapters with really good dialogue. Some of the best battle scenes that you've ever read, um, really good action sequences, fun creatures, you know, good versus evil, demons versus angels type of story setting with a lot of tropes that are subverted in just the right way. A lot of twists, a lot of turns, beautiful character arcs, some characters from beginning to the end of the series go on journeys that I just didn't expect and really appreciated. I love the momentum that this series builds to the end when there's high stakes. This series also has one of my favorite romance relationships uh, in anything that I've ever read. And I think you guys probably know what I'm talking about for those of you who've read this. If you're at all a fan of epic fantasy, quest fantasy, if you appreciate the tropes, but you want things done in kind of a fresh voice, I would absolutely check out uh, the, the Faithful and the Fallen series by John Gwynn. In particular, book four, Wrath, is so epic and it really just ties everything up so well. I think you'll have a really good time with it because it's one of my favorite series of all time. Book number seven is pretty special because in the same way that Harry Potter sort of spurred my love of reading and love of fantasy as a young person, this series got me reading fantasy again as an adult and is honestly probably supposed to be credited with coming up with my YouTube channel name, which is Rekindled Reader. It really rekindled my love of reading, love of fantasy, and just reading for, for fun after doing so many years of academia. This is The Hero of Ages, book number three in the Mistborn trilogy by Brandon Sanderson. Again, this is the last book in the series, so I can't say too much without spoiling it, but most of you who are watching this video will have heard of Brandon Sanderson and probably read Mistborn. It takes place on a planet in his Cosmere universe where ash falls from the sky and mist dominates the night. And there are these people called Mistborn, which have this unique ability to use metals and ingest them and burn them to affect certain things and push and pull and use it as magic and it's called allomancy and it's really cool, really well done, kind of scientific, but once you get the gist of it, it's really cool to follow. There's fun scenes in here. It's an epic conclusion. It's quite emotional. There are some themes in here like love, ambition, sacrifice, redemption, slavery, religion. It, it explores a whole host of things and it's done very, very well. There's a little bit of politicking, some some battles, some like war strategy and things. A big part of the story is the immortal Lord Ruler who is the evil in this world for all intents and purposes. But it goes much beyond that and it gets a little bit existential. And it's just a beautifully done uh, book, a beautifully done series. This is definitely my favorite in the trilogy. And if you haven't read it, I don't know what the hell you're doing. Book number six is one that I love so much I did a dedicated review for. A lot of you may have seen the movie of this, um, but the book is called The Road by Cormac McCarthy. This is, man, like I don't even know how to describe this. It's a, it's a hauntingly beautiful story of this father and son that make their way through a very bleak and desolate wasteland of, I think, America after the effects of this like unspecified catastrophe that destroyed everything. Everything is dark and bleak and in the face of despair and even cannibalism and things like that, it explores the fragility of hope and the love and the bond that can exist between father and son. Honestly, in my review, I talked about how I thought this was a metaphor for life. And if you're confused about how that might be or what that means, maybe go watch my review. I do a better job at articulating why I like this one and what I thought it meant. And there's some spoiler discussions at the end. Don't have to worry because it's clearly laid out and you won't get surprised by any spoilers. But this one is just a harrowing, poetic, moving, 
bleak story. It just talks about, yeah, the, the, the love and the hope um, that is most important in life and, you know, the relationships that kind of mold us and teach us and what becomes most important at the end of the day in one's life. Most of that probably didn't mean anything to you if you haven't read this. Uh, so if you haven't, I would urge you to go out and read this one. It is one where you probably want to read it in a certain state of mind. I would be cautious because this book is a little bit depressing. I wouldn't go in and read this expecting to have a wonderful day. You have to be in the right mood to read this. And I think there's a place for that in literature and, you know, in, in our books. It's the right mood at the right time kind of thing. And so if you're curious about this and you want a, a poetic, bleak, weird, kind of depressing book that's beautifully haunting in a weird way, uh, I would pick this one up. All right, top five. This is book number five now, and it's another one where I loved it so much I did a dedicated review on the channel. This book is Legend by David Gemmel, book number one in the Draenei series, and it's epic sword and sorcery, heroic fantasy done at its finest. Uh, this is basically about an old, grizzled, retired recluse warrior um, called Druss, and he comes out of retirement essentially to help this group of people, this uh, this city or whatever, against the threat, the imminent threat of this overwhelming enemy force. In my review for this one, I talk about why it was so special, why it resonated with me, and why it moved me a lot more than it could have. And part of that is the foreword by Stella Gemmel, who's his wife, mentioned that there's a story of how he wrote this one where he thought that he might have cancer. And the book is really kind of a metaphor about dealing with a seemingly insurmountable or, or unbeatable adversary, and that would be cancer. And so he sort of made a decision that if he had cancer, this would have a much bleaker ending. And if he didn't have cancer, then they, he would he would basically beat the enemy uh, and, and the, the heroes would win in his book. I won't say much more about it than that. Uh, you're going to have to read it by yourself, but the characters are awesome. Druss is an absolute stud. He's such a cool character. He's one of the best in fantasy, in my opinion. His dialogue is awesome. There's a, you know, it's a little clunky at the beginning, the prologue. It sets the whole thing up and it's a little clunky. It's definitely his debut novel, I believe. Uh, and it sort of, it reads that way, but it's one of the best in the genre. And the Draenei series goes on to encompass a ton of books. Like it's a very popular series by a very popular author. And uh, go watch my video if you're curious about more and some of the details about really what makes this one so special. It's just done perfectly. Uh, some people love it. Some people read it as just strictly, you know, a fantasy novel without the background and the understanding of how this book came into existence. It was written and then sort of tucked away and then found by his friend or so. I can't remember exactly the story. Go watch my video. I talk about it a little bit there, but there's so many things that make this special. A lot of people talk about this one when they talk about the classics in the genre and what really made the genre so special. This one came out at a time where fantasy was just was was awesome and uh this is some of the best in my opinion so if you haven't tried legend by david gemmel i would absolutely urge you to give it a shot book number four is book number two in one of my favorite trilogies of all time that is bernard cornwell's warlord chronicle trilogy this is book two called enemy of god i have yet to read a better book two in a series this is like height of book two. It doesn't get better than this. This series was such a blast from start to finish. It talks about the warrior king Arthur. It's a retelling in the dark ages where he's trying to unite the fractured kingdoms from like Saxon invaders. And there's Merlin in here and the Knights of the Round Table and everything that you know, but it's done in a very realistic kind of dark way. And it's told from the perspective of Dervil Kadurn, who is uh you know, the right hand man of Arthur. And I won't say too much more. Again, it is book two, but man, this, this book has so many moments. It has betrayal, like, oh, the betrayal in this book. It's crazy. It's dark and it's gruesome at times and a little bit disturbing, but it's magical at the same time. It does a good job of sort of explaining with a realistic twist some of the magic and some of the myth that you come to know with, with King Arthur 
stories. And Merlin, with his magic, like he's a druid, and there were druids around that time, but it's like, is it magic? Is it not magic? We don't really know. It's done so perfectly well. The audiobooks, um, I think they're done by John. I'm going to put up the name if I get it wrong, but I think it's Jonathan Keeble. He is one of the best audiobook narrators of all time. He is so like perfect for this book and these characters. It's just magnificent. And the battle scenes in this, Bernard Cornwell has a way of putting you right in the center of a battle and making you feel like you're wearing the armor and you're in the fight. There were times reading this where I felt like my heart was in my throat. It was incredibly immersive, compelling. Uh, emotional. I actually teared up in this one. There were a couple moments. There's a beautiful romance in this one too. And uh, a couple heart-wrenching moments that just landed with so much impact because of the buildup of the story. I could go on and on about how much I love this trilogy and this book in particular. Everything it does, it does well. It does everything that I like in my fantasy and in my historical fiction. It blends myth and history so well. I distinctly remember feeling all sorts of ways when I read this, from laughing out loud at some dialogue to getting punched in the gut and, and basically crying to then, you know, raising my fist and like fist pumping because some of the moments in here are so gratifying and it's such a perfect conclusion as well. Book three uh, is so good. The trilogy as a package is exceptional and I highly recommend it. Try this if you haven't. All right, top three territory now. This is book number three and it's one that I put off reading for an awful long time because of how big it was. It's like 1100 pages and I was intimidated for the longest time, but it then became my favorite book of 2022, my book of the year. And this one is Stephen King's It. This is one of the best coming of age stories you'll ever read. And it's woven within this like horror suspense thriller type of story. And the way that it's done is, is incredible. But at the heart of it, it's a coming of age story about a group of friends that reunite in adulthood to destroy and defeat this malevolent evil being that comes back to their hometown of Derry, Maine. Uh, take, it's sort of done in the past via flashbacks and in the present with the adults. And if you've seen the movie, you know exactly how this plays out. But the book is so good because he, he has so many pages to write and explore and make everything so immersive, so rich. The characters are just some of the best. I, I think about them a lot and I really resonate with a few of them. It's just a beautiful, beautiful story, but it's haunting and it's horror and it's suspense and it's everything Stephen King does well. There are some moments in here that are freaky as shit, but I had a blast with it. I honestly, I had a blast with it and I watched the movies afterwards and the movies I thought were, was, were great. The miniseries was really cool too, but they don't compare to the book. If you haven't tried the book, definitely read it. What this book does is it explores deep-rooted fears and the power of memory and the resilience of friendship uh, amidst this, this horror, right? This evil that comes to town. And it's done in such a beautiful way. I think, I think this book would resonate with a lot of people that aren't even horror fans. Stephen King has this tendency to get brushed with the horror brush and he, he does so many other things well and yes this is a horror novel there are horror elements there are moments that are scary but it's really a beautiful coming of age story and that's what is so unique and kind of cool with this is if you're a horror fan but you also like just beautiful stories and coming of age stories this is the perfect blend of both of those things and I didn't know how much I wanted a book like this until I read it so book of the year 2022 I love everything about it, and uh, I hope to reread it one day. Stephen King's It, this is book number three on the list. Book number two is what I consider to be my favorite standalone novel of all time as of right now, and also my favorite non-fantasy book of all time, although I'm corrected oftentimes that there's, there's fantasy elements in this book. It's so good that I have two of them, and this is Robert McCammon's Boy's Life. Talk about coming of age like Stephen King, it's done to perfection. It's really a blend of mystery and fantasy and suspense, thriller, um, coming of age in the most nostalgic, beautifully done emotional package you can imagine. It follows uh, a young kid in the summer of, I think, the 60s in a small Alabama town where he uncovers 
a bit of a mystery around a death and an accident. He uncovers a body. I believe he finds it with his dad or his dad finds it. And it just never lets up from there. It's told in little vignettes. Every chapter is sort of a vignette, not necessarily a different point of view, but it, it follows, it sort of weaves together the plot and the characters in a really satisfying way. And Robert McCammon's prose and his imagery and his description of this small town it doesn't get better than this. I'm telling you guys, it's one of the best books I've ever read. It is my favorite standalone novel at this time that I've ever read. And I feel like a lot of you who haven't read this would find a lot to enjoy in this. Robert McCammon is a master storyteller, a master writer. It really just hit all the notes for me. It's nostalgic, it's poetic at times. And the ending, I think I, I reread the ending, I think three times, uh, once right after I finished the book, the last chapter. And then I went back about a month ago, gearing up for this list and I reread it again. And the ending is perfection and it made me cry. And I'm not even ashamed to say that. I feel like I've cried at a lot of these books, but like whatever. I won't say too much more than that. This is one that you should just go out and read. Trust me, it's a very good book. And if you liked Swan Song, a lot of people say that Swan Song and Boy's Life are his best books. Some people like one over the other. Swan Song is oftentimes compared to uh, The Stand by Stephen King being sort of an, a post-apocalyptic um, book. But this one is the coming of age and the beauty of that in it without the horror element. It really just explores innocence and the, the, the awe and wonder and magic of life through the eyes of a child. It sort of blends a little bit of supernatural in here, which is why people say there's some fantasy in it, but it leaves it a little ambiguous and a little bit open uh, for interpretation, which is another really cool thing about this book that you can sort of interpret it a couple different ways. It's beautiful. It's my favorite standalone book of all time, that's for sure. But that leads us into my favorite book of all time, which is a fantasy book. So my favorite fantasy book, my favorite book of all time happens to be a fantasy book. And believe it or not, this is the only one that I don't own a hardcover of. So I'm going to put it up over here somewhere. There's a story about why I don't own it because I wanted a nice set of these and I gave away my, anyway, it's a series by George R. R. Martin. You might've heard of them. A Song of Ice and Fire. It's book three, Storm of Swords. A Storm of Swords is my favorite book of all time. There's not much more that I can say that hasn't already been said about this book, about this series, A Song of Ice and Fire. Game of Thrones, you guys probably watched the show. This is book three and there are a lot of really memorable things that happen. A lot of crazy moments. Uh, some of my favorite characters have some of their best moments in this. This is such a crescendo in the series. And I'm shocked at how much sometimes remembering this book, I'm shocked at how many things happen in this one book. It's a fat, it's a huge book. It never loses steam. It carries its momentum and it carries a lot of weight. And yes, it benefits from the fact that there are two you know, masterpiece books that follow, that precede it. And so it benefits from the buildup of all these events and these characters that you've come to know and love and this, in this world, this grim, dark world, right? But standalone, like if you take it by itself, I think it's done to perfection. And forgive me if I'm not articulate enough to explain all the things that make this book so perfect. But in my opinion, this is about as good as it gets in fantasy. And, and honestly, in literature, like as a book, as part of a series, which of course a lot of fantasy books are in series, it doesn't really get better than this. It weaves everything so expertly and everything that George does well uh, in this series comes to a climax in this book, for me at least. It's just one of those things where I probably am going to reread this book multiple times. I'm going to probably reread the series multiple times, even though it's we're not talking about the ending. We're not talking about Winds of Winter and the release date and when that's at. We'll talk about that in other videos. But as it stands right now, the journey is absolutely worth it. And this book three is one of the reasons why this is such a magnificent journey. It is the culmination of so many threads, so much drama and politicking and character development and relationship building and all these things. It is just expertly crafted. George R. R. Martin is a master, and this is a masterclass in storytelling. If you, like, these books are studied by authors, and I sort of understand why now. I don't want to say more than that, because you guys probably 
know exactly why I'm saying what I'm saying. Most of you people who are watching this video will have read that book. If you haven't, I implore you to just try them. Um, I, I did a review on Game of Thrones, a Game of Thrones, which is book one, from a first time reader's perspective because I had delayed reading these for a long time. I was intimidated by them. I thought the writing would be complex, too many characters, too big of books, but I was pleasantly surprised. So I implore you, if you haven't read these books for whatever reason, whatever rock you're living under, get out from underneath it. I don't know why I just did that. Get out from underneath it and go read these books. That is my favorite book of all time, A Storm of Swords. For a lot of people watching, that's probably not going to be a shock. Um, that leads me into my outro and my, uh, you know, request that you put in your favorite books of all time down below in the comments, because I'm so curious after taking time to build this list, what the hell you guys think and what your favorite books are. And if we overlap a little bit and where we don't, I'd be so curious to see. Anyways, that's all I got. That's my top 10 list. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you guys subscribe if you like stuff like this. And if you guys want more reviews and lists and recommendations, all that stuff, I'll catch you guys in the comments until next time. Catch you on the next video.